Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, put some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. My name is Mark, and on today's show, the Justice League costs a lot of money, the Avengers takes a lot of time, and one of the panelists enjoys high-speed internet for the very first time. <laughs> Who's joining us today, Ashley? Speaking of the devil, John Schnepp. What's up? <clears throat> I finally upgraded my uh, internet. Yeah! From, uh, uh, from, whoa, yeah! Someone didn't have internet for a whole day and like went into like a weird fetal position, like couldn't deal with like, but I've been dealing with like one up, one down speed. That's right, stone age technology. I'm, I'm in the future. <laughs> I'll see no. your Perry number off. I'm not the one who didn't have internet and went into the fetal position. Actually, I did. But I listened to a little It and I went to bed, which after Comic-Con, I guess it was kind of meant to be. You know, no internet and you get mm -hmm. some sleep. Uh -huh. Also here, Ken Napsack. <laughs> I don't even have an iPad. I have a speaking spell. A apostrophe. A apostrophe. That's my technology. <laughs> Ken still rocking his favorite 80s band rock set to his Zune. We have a lot of cool stories to get to today. So Ashley, what is kicking us off and how much money is it going to cost? <laughs> According to an extensive report from Variety, it looks as if WB and DC are spending big money to ensure that Justice League is a creative success and not a critical failure. Variety's report claims WB is spending upwards of $25 million in reshoots, they're calling extensive, and adding an extra two months to the production. Because of this, it's creating scheduling nightmares for its in-demand cast, most notably for Henry Cavill, who is shooting Mission Impossible 6 and is forbidden from shaving his mustache he grew for the part. The reshoots for JL now are forced to digitally remove the mustache from the movie. Insiders also report to Variety that Joss Whedon, who has now spent months overseeing the project, will not receive a co-directing credit. The studio has no comment, had no comment when Variety reached out for a statement. Mark, what do you make of Variety's report about Justice League reshoots? Oh man, we are going to get deep into the woods with this one, but when we come out on the other side, yes, we are going to talk about Mustache Gate. My first <laughs> indication that there was going to be something more than just minimal reshoots was when we had a story a few weeks ago, or maybe it was even a month now, that, hey, uh, Joss Whedon's coming in and he might be putting a different spin on things to the point when he might be in the running to receive a co-directing credit. Now, according to Variety's report, that is not going to be the case, at least in his credit. He's not going to be a co-director. He might get a writing credit or an executive producer style credit, but not co-directing it. I think that Jason Momoa should be the official spokesperson for anything that goes on with Justice League because he was so good about it at the panel in Hall H at Comic-Con this past Saturday when he basically said, oh, reshoots, oh yeah, it's, it, it's nothing major, we're fine. And that might be the case for Jason Momoa, but it certainly is not the case for some of the other primary cast members. Ken, when you look at this story, it seems a lot like what happened with Rogue One and Tony Gilroy coming in to direct those reshoots. I mean, about the same amount of time, probably the same amount of money. Now, us fans, all that we should really be concerned with is whether Justice League is great when it comes out. And I've said this before about reshoots. I don't care if your movie needs reshoots. As long as the movie's good on the day it releases, I don't really care. However, this mustache thing is hilarious. Like, the, the guy can't shave his mustache to go back because he's already growing one in Mission Impossible 6. So now I'm just going to be staring at a dude's upper lip to see if I can tell what is computer-generated skin over a real-life mustache. But also, we have confirmation that Henry Cavill is going to be in Justice League based on his mustache. Thank you. <laughs> In the long lineage of great mustaches like Tom Selleck and Burt Reynolds and Sam Elliott, now this mustache has finally given us official confirmation that Superman is going to be back in Justice League. Ken, this means hope. What does it mean for men's facial hair everywhere? Well, let me tell you, I wasn't supposed to be on here today. Uh, I'm shooting a sketch. I had a shave. Do you think I would look like this normally? I look like I'm on the I-40 and I got lost in a blimpy's bathroom. Uh, can you put another pepperoncini on my sandwich? I got to get the Peterbilt up the road to Kingston. All right? I, I don't look. I wouldn't do this on purpose. So I understand what you're talking about, Henry Cavill. I understand what you're, the parameters you're working with right now. Uh, I, 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 you mentioned Rogue One. And, and here's what I think about reshoots. 
I love that we ha have this job to talk about this kind of stuff. But I, 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 I miss the days where, and I said this in my news report yesterday, where I was riding my bike around town, playing G.I. Joe and Mask and Transformers with my friends, and we saw a commercial. Look, they made a movie. Let's go see it. And then <laughs> years later, you get some nice documentary. What if I told you there was $25 million reshoots on this movie? Wow, that's interesting. All this stuff unfolding now. Let it unfold. Let them make this movie. Poor Zack Snyder, this horrible personal tragedy. They had to change midstream. And I like that uh, a creative team might say, hey, you know what? That Wonder Woman thing kind of did well. What what did we do? Let's let's take elements of that. We we kind of had some things that weren't well received. It's like a relationship. You want to you at some point you sit down, you talk. Hey, you treat me like a jerk. You're right. I'll change course. That's what I want these creators to do. Rogue One. I had some problems with the first and second act. I love the third act more than anything. That was where most of the reshoots were. I like that Lucasfilm was like, we're not going to put this out. We're going to put out what we want. Uh, we want it to be right, and I'm okay with that. I also know how much Aquaman's little staff costs. <laughs> yeah. Apparently. I mean, Ken brings up the, the real difference in these Justice League reshoots versus what we got with Rogue mm -hmm. One, because Rogue One was simply Lucasfilm sitting down and saying, hey, we're not thrilled with how this is turning out. This might be too dark. It doesn't feel like we want it in our galaxy. With Justice League, there is a deeply personal tragedy that happened to the director that forced him out of being able to reshoot the movie. And you hear all these rumors about how they would have liked to have gotten another hand like Joss Whedon in there anyway. This is where we are now, where you have a guy who clearly has a track record of making some pretty great comic book movies coming in, handling the reshoots, and now they're spending a lot of money on them. So how different do you think these numbers are going to steer the course of the Justice League movie? The thing that was worrying me most about that variety story is how they're talking about what's going on with comic book movies and these massive budgeted movies, how it's changing the green lighting process where studios are basically preparing for situations like this now. That article said that reshoots typically cost between six to $10 million. We're talking about 25 million. And if that's what studios are preparing for, like in my mind, it's just like, why can't you just be ready from the start and not plan for disaster like that? But then again, this isn't necessarily disaster. It's kind of like what you guys both just said. If the final movie is great, I don't care how much money you spent on it. I just want a good movie in, in the end. And you know what? If this $25 million is a reflection of how well-received Wonder Woman was, and it's Wonder Woman's influence on what we're going to get in Justice League, and it's a whole bunch of people coming together, Joss Whedon now in the mix saying, you know what? We can make it better in this way, this way, and this way. Spend all you want, and the mustache thing just makes me laugh. I hope you all looked all over the internet yesterday because there were so many mustache memes <laughs> where people were just putting mustache mustaches on all the Justice League characters, yeah. and I, I kind of love how it's almost just like a big fat middle finger from Paramount to Warner Brothers. Like, heck no, we're not going to let him shave his mustache. We're going to make you digitally remove it. But, you know, like, who are they to say that he should shave it when then Paramount would have to digitally give him back a mustache. <laughs> I just find the mustache war is the most amusing part of this entire story. I mean, you feel like we're past that, that, that golden era of Hollywood where the studios pretty much owned the actors and told them, you gotta be in this many pictures and you owe us this, but studios still can literally tell a guy, hey, after you get out of the shower, we are gonna let you know when and when you cannot use your Gillette. You are not allowed to do it on this day because it says in your contract, you have to grow facial hair for this movie. Now look, Schnapp, when you get all to these reshoots and how much money they're spending, personally, I love the Justice League and I love Star Wars. I would rather have a mediocre movie and give like $50 million to starving children, but if you're gonna throw all this into Justice League, do you think it's going to have a dramatic increase on the quality of the movie we get to see this fall? <clears throat> I'd have to say most definitely. I think, you know, we've heard a lot about multiple reshoots. I mean, Zack had to reshoot a lot of the original shoot well, after Batman v Superman came out, they rewrote the entire script and added a lot. So, I mean, th this film has been having reshoots from the beginning. So, you know, a lot of people are, will argue how many versions of the Just League there are. None of us really know. A lot of us have heard a lot of rumors because some of us work in the industry and have know people who work on the, on the movie itself and, and have heard things like that. So it's either here nor there. You can digitally uh, take away. It's easier to digitally add than to take away. So I think that's why... I mean, Paramount, they're not being jerks about it. They're just like, look, you had your, you had your chance. You had your almost you know, year and a half of shooting. You know, now we have to make our movie. The guy's got to have a stash. 
you're going to have to digitally. So, yeah, I mean, I will probably be any close ups. They're probably going to be like, is that really his upper lip? Or <laughs> I see it looks fake. I sh they should just make him. Superman has like a me metallic upper lip. Like that would just be great. You know, he's like, I, I want a special cut where he's he's got a weird like Planet of the Apes, like monkey face where it's like it's super ape or something like that. It would make me a lot happier than having to be like, is that really his upper lip? And I can't tell. Do Who you cares, wear green really? tape? If you're, like, yeah. like, if, if you're digitally removing the mustache, do you have to put some sort of weird stuff on there when you're I mean, you said it's easier to add than take away. Yeah. But Mission Impossible is like, we're not spending the money. I wonder if like Warner Brothers could be like, hey, we'll pay for the stash. We'll pay for the digital recreation of this stash. <laughs> yeah. Well, Warner Brothers is definitely paying for it. But I think they're probably just putting those nodes, those little dots on Henry Cavill's so that they could track the stash. The stash track is what I'm going to call it. So, uh, you know what? I'm not concerned about all these reshoots. Like you said before, Rogue One had to deal with a ton of reshoots. They added a director who didn't get director's credit. I don't think Joss Whedon, even though he might, he could be possibly shooting more than half of the movie. He could be reshooting over half, which then it would have to go to arbitration because in the DGA, the Directors Guild of America, if you shoot more than half of the film, then you have to go to arbitration. And in the DGA, they don't share credit. It's not gonna say co-directed by because DGA, uh, the rules are one director. So like Robert Rodriguez had to leave the DGA so that he could give Frank Miller co-directing credit on Sin City. That's how it works single director so if they went to arbitration and they were like well how much of the movie did zach make of the original film and how much did joss remake if it's over 50 percent you're going to see some issues but i don't think it's going to be over 50 percent right at this point it could be 45 percent you know where they threw away 45 percent of the movie to add 45 percent of new material uh in the end you know the people like us who are going to go see the film it doesn't matter really. We want a cool Justice League movie. We hope that Warner Brothers and all the creatives work it out before, what is it, November 17th? So that's what I want. I want a, a really fun Justice League movie. Yeah, and it was really nice to see the, the the entire panel, the cast, the core members of the Justice League give so many props to Zack Snyder in Hall H and say that like he's the guy that, that, that is still leading this ship. Once this movie comes out, there's going to be tons of debate as to how much of this is Zack Snyder, how much of this is Joss Whedon, how much is the studio. The same thing that we got with Rogue One, the same thing that we will get when the Han Solo movie comes out. And the short answer is we're never really going to know. You're never going to see the Zack Snyder cut versus the Joss Whedon cut. So we're just going to have to, as fans, go in there and embrace the Justice League movie that we get and hope it's really good. I have not talked about men's mustaches so much on camera since I hosted 70s Porn Talk. It was a good run. Good run we had there. All right, Ashley, what's our next mustache-free story? The official Twitter account for 007 announced yesterday that James Bond will return in 2019. The 25th movie in the franchise will officially land on November November 8th of that year. However, no director has been announced at this time. And though the tweet didn't mention if Daniel Craig would be returning, late last night, the New York Times dropped a report saying Daniel Craig's return is a done deal. This according to two people briefed on the matter who spoke anonymously to avoid conflicts with Eon and MGM, the companies and studio behind the franchise. Ken, what do you think about the new release date for Bond 25? And do you believe the New York Times report saying Craig is back? I always trust the media. Yeah. Uh, no, I love this. Look, I uh, I am a Daniel Craig Bond fan. I ha he's he's my favorite Bond. I, I respect Connery and all the. I love the lineage of it. It's a great story and how they make all those movies. Watch that documentary. Um, but uh, Daniel Craig is the one I just bought into what he was putting out there. Uh, the, the Bonds never grabbed me because they're silly and this and that. And and I did like the dark, gritty version of Bond. And that's kind of a cliche now. So I'm excited that he might come back to finish his his arc as Bond. Uh, I'm all for a new casting. I, I'd be behind Hiddleston or Hardy or Idris Elba. I'm, I'm beside, uh, uh, behind all those kind of choices, but I want Bond, uh, Bond, Daniel Craig's Bond one last time. Uh, I'm still on board with uh, get some uh, someone like a Nolan to come in, like I said on uh, Movie Talk last week, I believe. Uh, I, I'm all for this, uh, and I, 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 I like the idea. Yeah, someone here at Collider named Mark put together these great show notes, as they do every day. And because my name is Mark, I will take credit for one of those show notes in this story is that the last Bond movie, Spectre, made $200 million domestically. You know what it made worldwide? $680 million. This thing is such a profitable franchise. Daniel Craig is a big reason why Bond is still so relevant today. So this makes total sense, and I do buy into the New York Times report late last 
last night that he will be back in addition to this film officially getting greenlit. We would suspect that they would want to get a Bond movie up sooner rather than later, regardless of who's playing Bond, because they want to keep that in the forefront of the public. And I think Ken brings up a great point here, Schnepp, is that now the real question is, who is going to be directing this movie? I think that the Daniel Craig Bonds have been up, down, up, down. And so yeah. who is going to be the one that brings it back to prominence? Daniel Craig seems to be a guy to me, and I may just be reading into this from my sports background, is that he wants a comeback pitch. He really wants to show the world that, yeah, okay, look, maybe I mailed in a little bit of Spectre, and maybe it wasn't as exciting as Skyfall or Casino Royale, but I still got something left to prove, and I think he's going to throw his best fastball. What say you? Well, yeah, the odds are with him because, you know, the odd films in the James Bond, Daniel Craig right. movies were, you know, the better ones. Casino Royale and Skyfall, Quantum and uh, Spectre, not so much. And, you know, to be honest, after Spectre, I was like, maybe he shouldn't be Bond anymore. Maybe and then hearing about, you know, it could be a negotiating factor. Maybe he was just tired. He was like very much like, you know, I'm tired of being Bond, this and that. Leave me alone. I think he is a great Bond. I, so I just think they should digitally add a mustache to him. When, <laughs> and, no, seriously, I, I want to see a fifth Bond with Daniel Craig. You know, we always have to wait a bunch of years. or like, how oh, he's getting being an older Bond. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like, so we want a fresh Bond. I want to see a return to Casino Royale Bond. So yeah, if they could wrap the that in, they could make that that kind of exciting James Bond, that gritty, darker version that Daniel Craig brought yeah. to Bond. I want to see that. Yeah. I thought Skyfall was the better Bond film of, of all of them so far. It felt yeah. like you get a little bit more into Bond's past. They brought in a lot of things from the o older Bond movies, but successfully, and then they kind of ruined it all of it with Spectre. So, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm like, that. they threw it all away. It's like that scene right there is from like, what I think is one of the dumbest moments of, <laughs> yeah. of the Spectre film where there's posters, like who is a, who is a Blofeld's art director? <laughs> like, here's a picture of this person that I artfully put here that yeah. in the building we're going, it's like, come on. Yeah, anyway, yeah. sorry, I'm not gonna go into a yeah. Spectre review, but I can't wait for this new movie. Yeah, so Perry, it appears that Daniel Craig will be signed on. We do mm -hmm. have a Bond 25 that is gonna be coming out in a few years here. You yourself have your bangs digitally enhanced for this show. <laughs> You're giving away my secret. <laughs> hey, look, the Worse world the has to know about the reshoots that went on with Perry's bangs. That's how they look before we put the actual hair. Yeah. That's like the placeholder. Ken is the green screen for your finish. A this special entire shout out to the one person during Movie Talk Live who we caught in the audience doing that. Someone showed me the footage and it made me so happy. I was going to say, I've been eating um, these goldfish out of this the entire time, but Adam has digitally removed the frames so you never <laughs> see me eat these. Watch, next time you cut back to me, you won't see this. Oh. And it's just gone. I don't remember what your toss question to me was, but for Daniel Craig returning, it's kind of like you have the best of both worlds no matter what, because I do think he is one of the best Bonds. I've liked, even when I don't like the movie he's in as much as other Bond movies, I do tend to always like his performance. Then again, I didn't mind the idea of getting a new Bond and having the franchise kind of reinvigorated that way after Spectre, which, yeah, was a pretty big disappointment. And yeah. I love the idea of an Idris Elba Bond. That is the one I was rooting for. But you know what? After Spectre, I am happy that he is... I don't necessarily know that Bond 25 will be the last. For all we know, he'll have a great experience and he'll want more movies. But... I'm happy that he's getting one more opportunity to get back to Casino Royale and Skyfall territory before his potential exit, if that's what's going to happen. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll hit the ball right back to you and ask you this. I mean, do you think that if, if Daniel Craig is back for Bond 25, where do we go from there? Because we're inundated in this culture now of if you have somebody new step into the role, you need to reboot it. Now, yeah. now it's an entire reboot. When the Bond films historically didn't really do that, you just had somebody else step in and play Bond, but the Daniel Craig one with Casino Royale was like, we're going to put the reset button on this character entirely. Are they going to have to do that again? That's a, I mean, that's a good point to bring up because it's not as easy as just wiping the slate clean of Daniel Craig and jumping back into it so soon. Because I think one of the biggest gaps we've had between Bond movies, in, in recent years at least, is when the role switched to Daniel Craig. That was kind of the mm -hmm. widest gap. And I think the only way to do it with someone like Idris Elba or anyone they put in the role is... We can't have it so soon after Spectre. We need some time to breathe. And I think it would have to be kind of a reboot type scenario. That's really the only way to do it. That's one of the most exciting things about the role. I know, you know, we don't want to bring up all the, the stuff with Batman right now, but 
the thing with Bond is giving me hope with other characters getting recast and having new versions of them is the Bond franchise has done it so well. It's like every iteration of Bond feels so true and so right to that particular actor and everybody is so memorable for a particular reason. And, you know, it's it's great to have so many di different iterations of the same character. So hearing stuff like this kind of just makes me hopeful for this happening with any iconic franchise and character. Yeah, Shneb, it, it's really easy to recast somebody and not notice it. Even with the Avengers, when Ruffalo stepped in for Edward Norton, right. we continue that lineage, but he wasn't necessarily the star of the Avengers movie, although he might have stolen the entire picture. This seems like it would be more of a Batman scenario when we had Kilmer, Keaton to Kilmer, they never really commented on right. this is a new Batman, but they did feel like you're getting a reboot. Yeah, you know what? I don't think they need to reboot the franchise with Bond 26, whoever they get. They get Hiddleston, whoever they end up getting, you just go with that. You recast M, you recast, everybody gets recast, every, everybody gets refreshed, but you don't have to go back to Casino Royale and have the Bond becoming Bond again. You could just go with some of the tropes from some of the more successful earlier Bonds. You can mix and match whatever your elements are, how you want to redefine Bond for, say, 2021. Mm -hmm. I don't think you have to wait five, six years and do a whole reboot because that's not what James Bond is. James Bond is like moves along with the times. Yep. So... That's what I, what's always exciting about seeing James Bond. What was really exciting about seeing Casino Royale, it had these Bondian moments, and they were doing like the origin of certain things for James Bond, which was cool for some of the people who've seen all the other James Bond movies. But, yeah. you know, do you have to watch all of them and like which ones are the best? Who knows? But I think rebooting isn't necessary. Uh, yeah, I just love the idea that Bond is this kind of character that lives in this this undefined kind of world, and I don't need Daniel Craig to make a reference to something Connery did. I don't need them connected. I don't need them shared. When someone else, you know, Judy Dench lasted from Pierce Brosnan into this, but you didn't, she never said, well, with the previous Bond. Like, it's right. just this thing that exists, and I don't need to overthink why or how. So that's why if, if, if Idris Elba is cast, you don't have to address this difference in the Bond, how he looks. No, that's James Bond. That's who he is. It's just that version for this time, exactly what you say. And glad it changes with the times because yeah. some of that Connery stuff, Roger Moore stuff, is either cheeky or, or not, not not appropriate for this times. Uh, so I, I yeah, I don't need to uh, reboot it. It would be. It just it's just a new telling of this classic character. I'm enjoying the comics too, where Bond right now is different than the Daniel Craig Bond, and mm -hmm. then they are also doing the offshoots of some of the other agents too, which is kind of fun. Yeah, if Connery's going to play Bond today, they might have to. Digitally remove some of that chest there because that's a whole lot. <laughs> I, don't I don't know. know chest hair is kind of making a comeback, though. That's what I want to believe. Yeah. All right. Let's chest hair defines how much of a man you are, Ellis. That's what I like to hey, say. Hey, I eat a lot of carrots, and apparently that puts hair on your chest. <laughs> Not sure what the connection is. What is opening in theaters this week, Ashley? It's Atomic Blonde. Agent Lorraine Broughton, Charlize Theron, is equal parts spycraft, sensuality, and savagery, and on an impossible mission. Sent alone into Berlin to retrieve a priceless dossier, she partners with embedded station chief David Percival, James McAvoy, to navigate her way through a deadly game of spies. Well, you hear the name Charlize Theron, and then you also hear director David Leach, and you're like, oh, uh, she is really good at playing a kick-ass character, and this guy loves that sort of real raw gritty feeling action and that's what you get with atomic blonde i saw the movie last week and i think that when you check out atomic blonde you're looking for some sort of really neat and inventive storyline to go along with that kick-ass action a lot like what you got with john wick i didn't see the mythology and the the interest in the world that i got out of that movie but i will say that atomic blonde i think had more of a stock tale but i still enjoyed what it was doing because the action we got along the way was just so awesome and you feel the the weight of these action scenes because these actors this isn't like some superhero where you just never get tired and your heart rate never goes above a hundred like you can tell how exhausting beating the crap out of somebody else is and these fight scenes are just so intense they're long they don't they, the camera doesn't cut everybody loved that daredevil hallway scene and then the stairwell scene in daredevil season two you get so much of that kind of stuff in atomic blood for that reason i did enjoy the movie although i didn't think it was a great effort because i i found the story somewhat lacking and thin and we've been to these places before but uh charlize is lorraine pretty damn badass perry do you recommend atomic blonde as a theater experience i don't know 
about as a theater experience? Because I think I had a really similar reaction to you. I really dug the action. The action in this is incredible. David Leach knows how to shoot action in, I mean, really ways I've never seen before, whether it's something that is giving you the impression that they all did it in one shot or just something where, because some of the stuff is so intricate and detailed, I can't even imagine how much just storyboarding and prep you would need to get to cover every single angle. And it's just no matter where she is, who she's fighting, how many people she's fighting, you always know exactly where she is, and it always feels real. It's the stuff when you see where, you know, she's a little tired. The people she's fighting are tired. They're hurt. It feels real, and it's nice to, you know, when we see so many superhero movies, it's nice to see a human being that got punched in the face act like they just got <laughs> punched in the face. But, yeah, I had, a, I had a really hard time with the story. I didn't like all the, the spy stuff. I didn't really, I didn't feel anything for any of the characters except maybe Sophia Batella's character. I think she does a great job of humanizing yep. Lorraine quite a bit, and I think that was kind of what made it work overall for me. But, you know... If I ever watch Atomic Blonde again, it'll probably probably be at home when I can just watch all the action sequences. Oh, they're so good. Schnepp, as a fan of, you know, when, when movies get translated from their source material, like what Atomic Blonde did, is this something that you want to check out? Well, I haven't read the original comic book that it's based on, but uh, I know they're re-releasing it with the title Atomic Blonde. I think it was something called something else, My Coldest Day of the mm -hmm. Summer. It had a, a different title. Um, yeah, from the from the trailers, it reminds me of like a much more violent alias. You know, it feels like that's what it reminds me of. She's like what, trading out wigs, putting on different outfits, beating the hell out of people. Um, yeah, I want to see those action scenes you're talking about. I, you know, I'm going to go see it. I, that, the trailers have sold me. I love Charlize Theron, so I'm 100 percent in. Ken, at your previous job, you had to beat the crap out of people in stairwells on a daily basis. Does this movie appeal to your greater sensibilities? Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, now I'm remembering all the fun. Um, yeah, actually, this is kind of like uh, one of the movies I want to go see just to kind of turn off my mind and have fun. Everything you're saying, nothing about it. Everything makes sense. Uh, I don't need this to win an Oscar, but I also want to be entertained and have some, like, eye candy up there to see, and I think this is going to deliver. I'm a, a fan of Charlize Theron as well, and I want to support something like this and something getting made with uh, with a badass female female in the front and center there. I'm all aboard. I like McAvoy, too. It's got it's adding up to like a little nice late Sunday afternoon snack that I'll go watch. Yeah, I would recommend it, and uh, I believe one of the people on this panel has an interview with David Leach. It's going to be appearing on this channel very soon. Oh, Who would that maybe. Be? That, that might be me. Actually, there's a little clip uh, of him talking about Deadpool 2 and uh, casting Ooh. Cable that's already on the channel, but the full interview, we talked about so many things from just the Atomic Blonde action scenes, and also his work as a second unit director, which I found really interesting, so keep an eye out for that coming later this week. All right, in the meantime, we're going to get to Buy or Sell. This is the part of the show where Ashley is going to give us a premise. We will say whether we buy it or sell it. And our first story is brought to you by Depends Adult Diapers. <laughs> and a surprise to no one, Avengers Infinity War is going to be one long movie. The third Avengers movie has been described as the culmination of the entire MCU, with pretty much every MCU character showing up in the movie. With most of the filming on Infinity War now wrapped, co-director Joe Russo revealed to Collider's own Steve Weintraub during a backstage chat after the Hall H presentation that the final Avengers Infinity War run time will very likely be at least two and a half hours. The current cut is over two and a half hours. Most of it's a movie you could show, but there's still a lot of work left to be done. I still have a couple of scenes that we haven't finished from Avengers 3 that I'm shooting in the next few months with my brother, and it's certainly going to be a film that lives in the two and a half hour, two and a half hour plus range. Jeanette buy or sell a two and a half hour plus Infinity War movie. I'm going to big buy this because, I mean, I trust the Russos. I mean, these brothers know uh, comic book films. They're great directors. I mean, remember when we were like, these comedy directors from Community, and then what's happening? Bam, we're like, minds exploded with Winter Soldier. I mean, so, you know, with their two uh, home runs with Civil War, I can't wait to see what they do. Three, two and a half hours, I was like, yo, bring it at three hours. This is like some Tolkien level. Like, this is the end of the last 10 years of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is the way they're talking about it. Avengers 3 is gonna put a cap on stuff. Avengers 4 is gonna open up perhaps phase four, however they're gonna, whatever phase they're gonna go into. So yeah, I wanna see a really well-told story. I'm in no rush once I get into the theater to leave the theater until I've seen what I feel is sat a satisfying end. And that's what the Russos are saying to us. They're saying, look, it's going to be over two and a half hours because we have a lot of different stories from all these different characters that we are trying to come and bring together. So 
I think it makes sense. Perry, too much, too little, just right. Um, I lean towards just right or too little. I mean, really, I tend to, you know, when we go to screenings and I hear that something is, is two and a half plus hours, I'm like, oh, oh I, <laughs> I, I hope this is worth it because it's not easy to justify a runtime that's that long. This is a movie that calls for it. And this is a movie where I think about seeing it and I don't think I'll be able to get enough. I mean, there's so many pieces to this where it's going to take so much screen time to really pull everything together the way it should be. And I'm not just talking about the lineup of a bajillion characters that we've come to know and love over the years. He also references how uh, bringing together the different tones of every movie. Then you have 10 years of storytelling that has to feel like it's going to culminate with this movie. There are so many things that they have to do to make this work right, where every single character has a real reason to be in this movie. I'm not just talking about someone popping up for the sake of a cameo because maybe they're going to be in the next one. I want to see a movie where all of these heroes actually serve a purpose in this narrative, not necessarily in the movies going forward. Uh, Ken, Perry is a lot more lenient than me when it comes to sitting in a theater and seeing that a movie's runtime is two and a half hours because if I'm in that situation, you got to impress me and you got to do it in the first 15 minutes because if not, I'm going to start thinking about why am I in this movie for this long. I start thinking about whether the parking meter is going to run out, that I leave the oven on at home. I love when I see news like The Dark Tower is about 90 minutes. And some people get nervous about that. And I'm like, good, maybe they told a tight story. I have a positive outlook on that. I was optimistic because Dunkirk isn't that long of a movie and it didn't need to be. And then I hear Infinity War it could be two and a half hours or even more. And I say, damn it, that is not enough. That is not enough because what the Marvel Cinematic Universe has done is show me really good stories, and you've also taken your sweet time telling them, not because you're keeping us in the theater ad nauseum, because you have a lot of characters to get to. The longest MCU movie to date was also directed by the Russo brothers, and that was Captain America's Civil War, with good reason. And then behind those are Captain America... I guess you had him and Iron Man teaming up for the first time in the Avengers, and then the Avengers Age of Ultron. Those all have a lot of moving parts, a lot of superheroes, a lot of political ideology, a lot of action scenes you have to get through. So I'm cool with that. And now you add all these new characters in there, plus the fact that I just saw the trailer, and I love everything I've seen. I want this movie to be four hours, so I just want to make sure that if this movie's two hours and 40 minutes, we can cram all the goodness in there. I know it's going to be split into two parts, the story could be, but Ken, Infinity War, let's say it's at 245. What does that do for your preparation? I bring an empty cup into the theater. Um, <laughs> look, I, I am one of the people, I, this, this scares me a little bit, but they've also, the Russo brothers and, and Marvel Studios have earned the right to tell the story completely, and there's like 102 characters in this thing, so you want it uh, done. It's also about what you like. This is seems daunting to me, uh, but I also I own all those Lord of the Rings versions where I have like an extended cut that is like an orc and a Yurikai arguing over chainmail for 12 minutes. I sit there and just watch it on a Saturday. Like I love this, like lose feeling in my legs. So it all depends what you want. If you're going to tell me Last Jedi is two and a half hours, I'm going to be there. But also, if Ryan Johnson can tell the story in 90 minutes, then I'm happy with that too. I want the the storytellers and the filmmakers to tell the story that they want and have it not seem jokes aside with this many characters. It would seem like a little bit of a loss if it's like, bam, 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 and you're only spending a couple moments. And there's Star-Lord. He's got to quit, but he's done. I want this to be what they've earned. This is a 10-year arc. This is an amazing achievement in modern storytelling and cinema that they set out to do this, and, and I want them to to end the story the way they need to. Yeah, and as uh, Ashley pointed out, our own uh, Frosty from Collider.com got this scoop in Hall H, and uh, it, Russo also went on to say that it is a culmination event, that you have 10 years of Marvel storytelling, and you have a lot of uh, disparate tones were, were the words he used from all these other movies, so you have to take the time to allow all those tones to mesh into this one giant hopefully masterpiece that we get to see can you guys think of any other examples like Lord of the Rings where it's a really long movie but it just flies by like that the only one for me is Braveheart I remember sitting in the theater as a youngster and seeing like man this is a long movie hope it's good and then the movie was over and I was like oh that's that's all you got that movie's three hours long mm. uh, <laughs> Godfather 2 Love that movie. I mm -hmm. love I love uh, movies that are really good and really long. I love it because you get to soak in that world for a little bit longer. So I'm a little worried about Dark Tower now that you just told me it's 90 <laughs> minutes. Now I'm actually concerned. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, the Dark Tower, we don't know what kind of world they're setting up if they're just trying to get in and get out. A very I, short world. 
Uh, all I know is that Infinity War could have a lot of good product tie-ins. You could have like Ant-Man catheters. They're really tiny. Nobody can notice them, and uh, you can stay in the movie uh, a little bit longer. All right, let's move on to the next story then. <laughs> According to a report from THR, <laughs> Oscar winner Anne Hathaway is in talks to play Barbie in the Long in the Works feature project. At the same time, rising, Aus rising Australian director Althea Jones is in talks to direct the movie after being handpicked by Hathaway, who THR says was an integral part in choosing a filmmaker. The script tells a story about a woman that slowly awakens to the fact that she doesn't fit in the perfect land of Barbies and journeys to the real world where she discovers that being unique is an asset. The movie is being described as a mix of big and enchanted. The studio is eyeing a June 29, 2018 release, depending on Hathaway's schedule. Perry Byersell and Hathaway in the Barbie movie. I was going to buy it, and then I saw that image, and I'm like, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Um, now, I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt right now, because we don't really know all that much about the movie. They, they do have a very loose plot out there, but until I kind of see, I think this is a situation where you need to see someone in the role a little and see them in the context of the movie where you understand the tone a little more. Because when you say to me that, oh, Anne Hathaway is replacing Amy Schumer, that to me sounds like two completely different Barbie movies. I think this concept of, like, I think that the whole idea is that is that she gets uh, she gets kicked out of Barbie world because she's not perfect enough. I could see that working with both actresses, but I think the Anne Hathaway version of that story is really different. She's been doing really well with comedy. So I'll tell you, Colossal is one of my favorite movies from the past few months. If you haven't seen that, go check it out because she straddles that line of comedy and real drama in that so well. I don't necessarily know if that's going to be appropriate for Barbie, but... I, I am a big fan of Anne Hathaway. I mean, really throughout all the years, and especially as of late, I know some people are a little turned off by her, but I think this has potential. It's just I can't really picture what this version of the movie is going to look like compared to what I was thinking about for Amy Schumer. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Anne Hathaway. She has such incredible range for an actress where you can go from something that's hilarious, like Get Smart or Action Packed, like The Dark Knight Rises, or musical like Light Miz, and I, I sell this completely. If Anne Hathaway doesn't have a chance in Barbie land, what shot do the rest of us have? I mean, you're talking about a plot here where somebody finds out they're not perfect and don't fit into this perfect look of what Barbie is, and Anne Hathaway is your choice. The Princess Diaries is your choice. There's so many actors and actresses of all shapes and sizes that you could put in here and really make a difference in people's lives when they say, oh, I feel like that person, I can relate to that person. Anne Hathaway can be vulnerable and she cannot be perfect and I've seen her you know dress down like, like if you have something like Les Mis or Love and Other Drugs but I just she is a movie star and she is very attractive and she has that classic Hollywood look and I think that if this is the plot then I don't really buy her in there I think Amy Schumer would have been a great choice because she has comedy chops and she also doesn't have the classic Barbie look and so that's why she would feel ostracized I just don't get the Anne Hathaway casting here she puts butts in seats for sure Ken she certainly is a very talented actress, but if this is the plot of the movie, I think Barbie already sells people on it, and I think the message this movie is trying to make might be short-sold a little bit if Anne Hathaway is your lead. Yeah, I, 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 I'm a Hathaway fan, I guess, as well. I, I, Devil Wears Prada, I love that movie. I really legitimately... Legitimately, do um, <laughs> Comic Con till day forty-two at Comic Con. Hey, right you now. didn't get the flu yeah. like uh, Cobster's the first one apparently that, uh, that oh, got nervous. Oh no, I, I start yeah. taking medicine the moment I hit the town. Yeah. Uh, anyways, I'll I sell that too. I, I sell the idea. I, I get what you're, you're. You're right. Like this, this seems on paper like a different version with Schumer. I like Trainwreck. I like what she she does. Uh, but I like Hathaway too. I, I I'll wait to see what they do. As long as the themes are kind of the same, I think that's fine. But it is on paper a tougher sell. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all I'll say. I mean, you get a, get a female director in there, keep the tones the same, keep your story the same. I just think I'm s overall selling the idea of a Barbie movie. <laughs> Yeah, you can certainly do that, too. I mean, yeah. Shnep, you're getting an emoji movie, you've got Lego <laughs> movies, you've got Spurt movies, and they come in all varying degrees of quality. What do you say about a Barbie movie with Anne Hathaway as your lead? Well, look, I mean... Is this going to be a 3D like Barbie movie, or is this a live action like it's Anne Hathaway? I think it's live action. All right, so I mean, with Amy Schumer involved now, was Amy Schumer originally going to write it as well? I think I, she did do writing yeah. work on All it. Right, I think so she might have rewritten some of it. Now, are they going to keep her original script, or is this like a brand new thing? She did a polish on the script. 
And I don't think it, the story, the source story references whether or not they're going right. to throw that out. Well, it's really difficult to tell. I mean, because uh, Barbie is a, you know, it's a, a, a toy, which a lot of uh, a lot of gals and guys get into. You know, there's Ken. There's a whole world of Barbie. And, uh, you know, I think they've been diversifying the brand more so recently than before. So I feel like, you know, I mean, this story is kind of like, you know, she's not accepted by Barbie. So she goes, what, to the Smurf world? Or I mean, like. I don't really understand. I guess I'm not really clicking in. It's the world we're playing in. Yeah, I don't know where we. I mean, I don't really understand. I guess until I see a trailer. I think Anne Hathaway is great, so I'm going to buy the casting of Anne Hathaway until I actually know a little bit more and see visually what this Barbie is going to be. I know it's not marketed towards me. I'm not, you know, hey, can't wait for those Barbie deluxe whatevers. I mean, so I know it's going to be marketed for kids, and I hopefully. It, the way that they're writing it is to show that everyone should be accepted in our world. So I, I get that feeling like maybe that will be a learning experience for the Barbies that maybe kick out the Anne Hathaway Barbie. Perry, you're making these weird faces. <laughs> Am like I ruining your you, Barbie hearing thing? Hearing you describe yeah. it, I don't I give a shit about I'm, Barbie. I'm imagine, so, can you imagine anybody yeah. getting together and being like, you know what, guys, we got to have a meeting because this Hathaway, <laughs> she just ain't perfect enough for our world. I know, like, she really? must go. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I'm buying Anne Hathaway. All <laughs> right, I will throw it over to the news desk. And, and I don't know if, if you ladies grew up playing with Barbies as much as I did with G.I. Joes. My sister used to take <laughs> my G.I. Joes and have them make out with Barbie. And I was like, first of all, you're ruining Xantar's good name. Second of all, he's like half her size. This does not link up. Ashley, do you think that Anne Hathaway fits in the Barbie world or would you kick her out? You know, I actually have a similar story. My brother used to take my, my Barbies and wrap them around the neck and bungee jump them off my balcony. And I remember my favorite ones would always get stuck on the roof and it would make me sad. But um, I don't know, just <laughs> with the casting news and stuff, when I hear Amy Schumer like in the Barbie movie, I just figure, oh my God, I can't fit into this dress. Oh, I'm so relatable. And then you hear Anne Hathaway and then she's like, oh, I'm so quirky. It's like, what direction are we going in here? And then I think I remember news about Diablo Cody being involved in the screenplay and with her um, writing Juno and then Jennifer's body. I, all, I still don't know where this is going. So I think it depends on what direction it goes in. Hearing the premise, I think it sounds a little bit cheeseball. It reminds me of this Tyra Banks movie from a long time oh my ago, God, I Life Size. That. Yeah, so can we just like pick a direction and like make it clear and then and then I'll decide how I feel about this. If you want to swing by the MOVA's household, you can look for the roof with all the barbers <laughs> still on it. Uh, Wendy Lee, what's your take on all this? I mean, even when Amy Schumer was involved, I was never big on Barbie the movie. I just I just don't understand the it's kind of like what Ashley said, like which direction are you going? Are going the Amy Schumer way where she's trying to be relatable or the Anne Hathaway, which is quirky, but either way I, I sold it from the get go. I, I am not like I did I have Barbies growing up, sure, but like my way of playing with them was I, I would like butcher their haircuts <laughs> and, and I would like try to I don't know, fix their hair and it just my mom's like, You're not getting more any more Barbies if you destroy them and I was like, I don't care. Um, so no, <laughs> I am selling this. You can put any actress in it and it's just I am not the target audience, so I'm selling it 100%. Barbie's I have a better Barbie roof. idea now because <laughs> Diablo Cody was brought up, and I'm looking at Charlize Theron. I want a Barbie movie that's more in the vein of young adult with Charlize Theron in the Barbie role. She was See, great in young adult. If it's like an R-rated Barbie movie with this exact premise where her young adult character gets booted from Barbie land... I would like that. I think you could have you could have something where it's like the Disney princesses, what happens with them in Wreck-It Ralph, which you guys are going to see the Wreck-It Ralph sequel. It is a lot of fun. It turns that image on its ear. But the bottom line is if you're making a movie and somebody is not perfect enough and they get kicked out of this world and your choice is Anne Hathaway, when you have a lot of other people, I think, on the table, it doesn't have to be Amy, Amy Schumer. It could be anybody. Anne Hathaway looks pretty perfect, so I don't really buy it. As of right now, we'll have to see how that story unfolds. We do want to remind you guys that you're watching Clutter Video right now. This is by far not the only show that we have on our YouTube channel, including the one that is Thrones Talk, and that is hosted by our own Ken Knapsack. How's Thrones Talk going? Thrones Talk is going great. <laughs> Season 7 is off to a wonderful start. It's actually one of the best starts for me uh, that Game of Thrones has had. The first two episodes have been great. Check it out. We go in deep. Rachel Cushing, John Roca, Dennis Zen. We uh, love talking Thrones. We also have TV Talk uh, was on yesterday, and we have a new team, Schmodown, that is going to be dropping later on today between Deep Cuts and IGN. It could be a barn burner. And also our own John Schnepp hosts a new show on the YouTube channel called Comic Book Shopping. You got Jacob Battle on last week, and now 
Tim Miller is talking all sorts of stuff and buying some comic books with you. Yeah, we talked a little bit about, you know, Deadpool 2. Obviously, he's not directing it. We talked about his feelings about that. We talked about a lot of other potential projects, which this man has got a lot of amazing projects coming up. Uh, we go through a few of them. Some of them we had to edit out because he's like, don't talk about that. Don't talk about this. The man's got some of the greatest things coming up that, you know, and he's an incredibly cool guy and he's a sweaty nerd. Definitely check it out. Comic book shopping with Tim Miller. And also check out Heroes hosted by that young man. We're going daily with it this week. So check out yesterday's episode. Check out today's episode. Maybe you get a special guest. I don't know what's going to happen. We also have a really cool contest y'all can check out. If you want to see Dunkirk, we're giving away a Christopher Nolan and cast signed Dunkirk IMAX poster. The prize pack also comes with a Dunkirk backpack, a pocket watch, a compass, and a two-pack IMAX movie box. You guys can check out more in the link in this video's description on how to win all that cool Dunkirk stuff. And last but not least, always check out Awesome Tack Air, hosted by our own Jeremy Johns. You guys can get the link to the most recent episode in this vid's description that's a lot of yapping so i'm going to remind you guys at the end of this live show we're going to take some time for your live twitter questions go ahead and start tweeting us at collider video in the meantime we move on to mailbag ashley mova what they've been sending us this week Peter Hong writes, hey guys, my question for you all is regarding pirated or leaked trailers. After the Hall H panel where Marvel showed the new Infinity War trailer, lots of leaked low quality videos have been put online. I've been trying to stay away from them mostly because I don't want my first impression of Avengers Infinity War to be from someone's phone camera. What do you guys think? Should we stay away from these bootleg trailers in a way or just give into temptation? Uh, it's it, it's a hard thing. I mean, I'm not going to tell anybody. Look, every all your friends got to see something and you didn't. You're dying to check it out. I'm just telling you, like, it's not worth it. It's kind of like if you're if you think you're hungry and you know you're going to get a steak later in the week, but you just got to cram that twink in right now. It might feel good in the moment. It's not going to feel good afterwards. I would try to hold off as much as you can, especially for an experience like this. You want it to be as much of a surprise as possible. It's easy for me to say. It's very hard to put into practice. I myself have been online in the past and looked for pirated stuff just because I want to see I need to be the first one it's usually Van Halen bootlegs but sometimes it can be movies too Ken have you ever fallen prey to this temptation <clears throat> cleanse yourself of your sins Peter do not give in to the temptation <laughs> of piracy uh, I have at some point I've done it because ah, I want to see something but for the most part I, I do try to avoid it just because it, it's I, I as a fan all right, say so, so. A scene from The Last Jedi. I, I, I'm a big Star Wars fan. We know this. Um, I want to wait to see it on screen, how it's supposed to be presented. I keep going back to, I really want the storytellers to do what they want to do. And that's, I want to respect that. Where if you see something before, you see something off the side, I, 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 I try to avoid it. I will not persecute anyone out there who does. I know some people who, uh, oh, did you see Wonder Woman? No, I haven't a chance to go to the theater yet. Oh, I know, I torrented it. What? You, you know, go to, go. Give the creators your money. Like they need. Yeah, it's a tough yeah, thing. I think we're talking about a couple of different things. Like torrenting a movie, that's just wrong. I think you're like yeah. you're ripping off the artists. You're ripping off everyone. You're stealing from them. Uh, so when you torrent a movie and you're like, oh, I didn't feel like paying for it, you're a jerk. It's just simple. It's like you're you're not taking into account that you're stealing from people. It'd be like if you worked somewhere and someone just came and was like, oh, you're not going to use all that money that you just worked for, are you? I'm going to take all of it. And you'd be like, wait a minute, that's not cool. Exactly. But as far as these kinds of presentations that are done at panels and things like that, I think that's slightly different because is, they're yeah. given to the public and they're like, it's for a very select few people. And for the most part, you're not seeing these crisp versions. You have to see like some weird trapezoidal version, <laughs> strangely shaking while the nerd is <laughs> like breathing in the mic. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe that you had this fan on she's throwing a moon. <laughs> like you're listening to that and like somebody's giant head is in the way while you're like, if only they would, if they could just move their head. It's like, that's what you're getting instead of the full crispy or whatever on your phone crispiness but just not the shaking weird camera so believe me when tron yeah. legacy when they showed that footage of the light cycles before they even shot the movie they're like here's some test footage of some stuff we're working out i was such a big and still i'm a giant tron fan i remember it was at comic-con so he's like what do you mean they showed a tron movie i didn't even know they were working on this so, yeah they showed this like five minute light cycle thing that night, I was like, <laughs> like trying to find like some nerd film something, and I found the nerd. It was like a weird trapezoidal shaky camera with somebody's head in the way. And I watched it like a hundred times. I was like, I can't believe they're making a Tron movie. That was great because that's free publicity. 
I think a lot of that kind of stuff, like Suicide Squad, nobody cared really about Suicide Squad until that trailer dropped from Comic-Con that no one was supposed to see. And then, I mean, I know DC was like, well, we didn't want to release this trailer, but since everyone's already seen it 25 million times with a shaky cam, here's the actual real one. And then didn't that make like 100 million views or something? And it got everyone excited. And then that movie made like $800 million because that initial shock of like, wow, this is really cool. I want to see it really carried through for the entire year until the film came out. So sometimes that advanced publicity or that keeping the publicity away, look, everyone wants to see, everyone on the planet Earth wants to see Avengers Infinity War. Everyone wants to see that trailer. Marvel is really smart. They released the Thor Ragnarok, you know, the new, tra the new trailer. They didn't release the Black Panther or the Infinity War stuff. Everyone wants to see that. Everyone's like, I'm mad at Marvel. And look, it's Marvel's right to not show you. And they're like drip, you know, dripping it out slowly. D23, 3,000 people. You know, Comic-Con, 6,000 people. So 9,000 people on the planet Earth have seen this. It's like, yeah, is it fair? No, but if you went to this, they make it so special to be at these events. And that's the kind of thing. Everyone is eventually going to see the Infinity Wars trailer and you're going to dig it. I mean, they're great. These trailers are great. So it's sort of like it does build this anticipation. Is it fair? Well, maybe next year you're going to have to make it to San Diego Comic-Con and wait in line to, to see this. I mean, I don't know how that weighs out in the fairness world. So I think it's kind of fair. Perry Nemiroff. Yeah, I'm kind of black and white on this issue. I mean, we talk about it, I, most recently we've been talking about it with some Han Solo photos that leak. Uh, I, I don't like it. I think that whether you're talking about torrenting a movie where you should, where you're supposed to be paying for the full movie, or we're talking about people who pay for Comcom badges, pay for flights, pay for hotels, it's not cool. It's not cool to pirate anything in any capacity. I don't condone it at all. I'm not going to say I've never seen a pirated trailer online because working in this industry, especially in my early days when I'm, when I'm writing blogs all the time, you go through news feeds, you click on something and it starts to play. It's always crappy footage. And really, I'm not going to go and tear apart anybody who, who seeks something out because they're so excited about Tron or Avengers Infinity, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but for me personally, as someone who is insanely excited for Infinity War and who has been foaming at the mouth for that damn footage since all of you saw it at D23, there is no way I'm going to click play on that video and ruin it for myself like I that. Will, uh, I'll never forget the experience of the first uh, pirated trailer I watched. I was a freshman in college, and my roommate had queued up this little thing. There was a lot of buffering involved, just this little tiny box. He's like, hey, dude, you got to come check this out. He hit play. And this was pretty high quality stuff. And I saw the Lucasfilm logo. And then I heard a crowd go bananas. And I'm like, what the hell am I watching right now? It was the first trailer for The Phantom Menace. And I was like, oh, my God, this is the greatest thing ever. I immediately decided I need to find out when I can see this in a movie theater. And so I got my Meet Joe Black tickets yep. and ran out there. But I still, to this day, I just remember getting chills because I didn't know that I knew the movie was being made, but I didn't know that, like, a trailer had already come out or debuted somewhere, and I was like, oh, my God. And then the movie came out, and, uh, well, that Darth Maul fight scene, that was something. All right, I said we'd save your time for your live Twitter questions. I'm getting the red light, but, Wendy, we're going to do one question, and we're just going to, like, run super fast through it. <laughs> so what is our Twitter query today? All right, this one comes from Ali Slate, who writes, in light of the Barbie movie, what other toys would you like to see brought to the screen in a live-action movie? I'm going to go right to our toy expert. Wait, is it John Schneffer Ken Napsack today? <laughs> I'm Ken not first. Sure, who to get? Barbie <laughs> Ken. <laughs> you are uh, in the Barbie legacy. It's, oh, believe me, I've, uh, people have asked if I've got a smooth bump too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, my uh, toys, just based on toys, I, we've already had Transformers, we've already had G.I. Joe. Uh, Mobile Armored Strike Command mask. They're yeah. back in the comics. They're rechanging a little bit, part of a Hasbro shared universe. But uh, it was always hokey and silly, but also had some interesting, fun things. Uh, you got Miles Mayhem of Venom. You got Matt Tracker and the mask team. You got a lot of cool things there. Give me a mask movie. Ken, let me, let me double up on your mask yeah. and go right with the same storyline from the same toy line, Rom Space Knight <laughs> yeah. and the Micronauts. I would love to see the Micronauts universe the great comic book series from the 70s. I know there's all these issues with rights. Figure it out. Get it done. I want to see Baron Karza. Perry Emeroff. I want to see an entire movie with the Spice Girls Barbie dolls. 
Just like Spice World remade nowadays with yeah. those Barbie dolls. But seriously, more so than anything, I want my R-rated Lego movie. Uh, Battle Beast. Anybody mm. remember Battle Beast? Yeah, they're do little, remember they're tiny. Beast. They had there were three mm. different like you had the the fire, the earth, and like the wind or you could have Earth, Wind, and Fire like do the soundtrack. And like you you would rub their chest so you'd find out which one they were and then like which team they fought for. It would be <laughs> an epic clash. Allie Slade, by the way, she's a big fan of the show, and she is part of Robcom this weekend. Uh, Bristol, Tennessee. I believe they're going to be doing a uh, evening with Timothy Zahn. So make sure you follow Allie at Glitter Geek, I believe, at Glitter Geek Allie and get more uh, info on the Timothy Zahn evening that you can have down there in Bristol, Tennessee, one of Ken Knapsack's favorite states in the I, entire I love the Tri Cities of Tennessee. It's a great area. Go it's to that Cheddar's. A good place, <laughs> indeed. I don't think they have a Cheddar's there anymore. I want to thank you guys for joining us here on Collider Movie Talk today. John Schnapp, where are you going to kids find you? You guys find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnapp. Perry Nemiroff. Uh, Twitter and Instagram, at P. Nemiroff, and keep an eye out for Collider Behind the Scenes this Saturday, 2 p.m. PST, all about Comic-Con. My minor league baseball announcing partner, Ken Napsock. Wow, would you look at that. That fly ball went deep, and God, we got a tie ball game. See you next week. I'm Ken Napsack. He's had too much scotch. That was a foul ball. We go over to Ashley Bova. It's Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, <laughs> Ashley Bova. <laughs> Happy <laughs> Tuesday, guys. <laughs> Always up to play along with our silly voices, Wendy Lee. Oh, I can't do one of those, <laughs> unfortunately. Come on, just try it out. It's fun. You oh, got that. Wendy Lee Zaney at Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat. <laughs> It's actually not that hard. You can subscribe to Collider Video right here, and you can follow me at Mark Ellis.